Welcome back Guardians. Witch Queen is almost upon us and I think it's finally time we take a comprehensive look at Savathun herself. Over the past few weeks we've covered her throne world, her viral chant, how she might acquire the light, but now let's get down to the nitty gritty of it and review everything we think we may know about the Hive God of Cunning. But before starting, this video is sponsored by HelloFresh. HelloFresh delivers seasonal recipes with fresh and pre-measured ingredients right to your door so that anyone can make delicious meals at home. As many of you know, my wife Danny is pregnant and she normally enjoys cooking at home. But unfortunately, I think we've been slipping into ordering more takeaway just because it's the easier option. And of course, life is not going to get any easier or less stressful once the baby arrives. So I'm very thankful for HelloFresh coming to the rescue. It makes cooking at home the easy option. So easy that even I can do it. <laughs> and lets us focus on our goals of eating healthy again. Without the stress. I'll be honest. I've put on some sympathetic pregnancy weight. One of the big things for me is saving time. Saving time not having to go do the grocery shop but also time in making the meal and the preparation because everything's pre-measured and ready to go. One of the things I've also enjoyed is getting a bit of variety back into our weekly meals. Everyone has their go-to meals that they make each week and it's nice to have a bit of spice, <laughs> quite literally and metaphorically, uh, back into our weekly meals. So you can choose from 50 weekly menu options uh, and market items to choose from. So you don't have to worry about planning the week's meal. If you are interested, you can use my link or go to hellofresh.com and use code POGMILAN16 for up to 16 free meals and three surprise gifts across six HelloFresh boxes, plus free shipping gifts include free appetizers, free desserts, and free premium recipes. And with that, let's begin this latest Destiny 2 lore episode. Let's start right back at the beginning with the origins of the Hive. Oryx, Zebra Wrath, and Savathun belonged to a weak, short-lived race known as the Krill, also referred to as the Proto-Hive. After their father, the Osmian King, was betrayed and killed, the three siblings managed to escape and in their quest to reclaim their home, they encountered the Worm Gods. These gods offered a bargain to the siblings, ingest their larvae and be granted immense power and eternal life, so as long as they continue to feed their worms with death and obey their natures. Strength for Zivu, cunning for Savathun, and exploration for Oryx. The trio accepted and took the worms back to their people, thus the hive were born. Even as lowly Krill, Savathun or Sathona, as she was known, already exhibited many of the traits that would come to define her. She was manipulative, cunning, and often had ulterior motives for her actions. You could even argue that Savathun is to blame for the creation of the Hive in the first place, as she was the one that listened to her father's worm familiar and convinced her sisters to dive deep into the depths of the Fundament, where they met the Worm Gods. Have a listen to the Books of Sorrow entry, Needle and Worm. It reads, the needle ship carved in my code by Sathona, a liar. We salvaged the needle from the Shuvbi maelstrom. I knew it would be there. I know its purpose. I know what happened to the crew. Zari wants to sell the ship at Kahan Atoll, where species gather. At auction, it would earn us enough wealth to hire mercenaries. We could retake our Osmian court and send the baby-eating helium drinkers screaming into the ocean. But I told Zyro the ship was worthless. Orash wants to open the ship and see if we can take command of it. I know this is the right thing to do. I know because I asked the worm. It was my father's familiar. I ripped it from him as we fled. It is a dead white thing, segmented, washed up from the deep sea. It's dead, but still speaks to me. It says, listen closely, O vengeance mine. While the Books of Sorrow is full of Hive history, we don't get a lot of information on Savathun from the Books of Sorrow, as it mainly focuses on Oryx. We do, however, learn that she is the one who came up with the Hive's tribute system, although it was Oryx who later enforced it. 
According to the law book, Truth to Power, this system was actually a diversion and Savathun had a different plan for escaping the need for tribute. Have a listen to the law entry, Injection. It reads, Now in ancient days, her brother Oryx spoke according to the plan Savathun had devised for him. Saith Oryx, The worm within demands tribute. Now you shall kill what you can and take what killing you need to grow, all for your own purposes. If you dare, and tithe the rest to that which rules you. Thus, tribute will ascend the chain, and the excess shall pull at the height, as unlike a river to an ocean. But Savathun, desiring neither a chain nor a pool, set about devising a secret way to feed the worms of her broods. Thus, she would escape the trap. Okay, so this plan was later named Imbaru, which we also learn about in Truth to Power. The basic premise is that after accumulating enough power through killing, Savathun was able to switch her tribute system to one based on deception. Have a listen to the law entry, thank you. It reads, I've tried to put an ascendant in orbit of a black hole while its spawn gather the tribute of an eon, but the worm is not satisfied, for it sees the trick. What I must do is amplify the speed at which tribute is gathered. A pocket world where time passes quickly would do well. Or a world where time is a Taurus and infinite violence might be gathered. With such a murder battery, I could become a being of supreme insight. With this tribute, I shall undertake a mighty work, a real humdinger of a scheme. I'm going to refinance my entire existence. I'm going to move from an existential economy based on the accumulation of violence to an existential economy based on the accumulation of secrets and the tribute of failing to understand me. I shall name this tribute of failing to understand Imbaru, for it shall be as formless as the mist. While Savathun achieved some success with feeding her worm off deception, it seems Imbaru was not enough for Savathun to indefinitely feed her worm. At the very least, the worm got so large that Imbaru was inadequate. Have a listen to the law entry Ripe, in which Savathun describes her time disguised as Osiris. It reads, When they first reached for me, I reached back in acid mockery, and they opened themselves to me in stupid, naked innocence. I was giddy. My fingers raked their minds. I forced my will through them using only words and met no resistance. The naivety was beyond description, and I feasted until my eyes welled with black tears. Even here, basted in deception both ample and rich, the worm cries ravenously. It has grown grotesque, skin taut, overfed, and still it howls for more. It commands me to keep it alive. Moving back to the books of Sorrow, the other primary topic relating to Savathun is of course Coria Blade Transform. When a young Crota tried opening a portal from Oryx's throne world, Savathun tricked him into releasing the Vex upon his father's throne. The Vex then created Coria in order to understand and exploit Oryx's throne world. Oryx of course defeated and later took Coria before gifting the Vex mind to Savathun. Have a listen to the Books of Sorrow entry Strict Proof Eternal. It reads, I have a gift for you, says Oryx. Savathun, Witch Queen, looks at him with dry wariness. Is it the sword logic I need to go into the deep and take your power for myself? It's a Vex I captured, Coria Blade Transform. It made an attempt to puncture my throne. I thought you might enjoy studying it. Coria contains a Vex attempt to simulate me. It might generate others. You, perhaps, will leave your wrath. I've left it with some will of its own, so it can surprise you. While Coria could initially only simulate Oryx's original krill form of Orash, Savathun was able to teach the Vex mind to use Hive Magic, which allowed it to accurately simulate the Taken King. Using this simulation, Coria was able to become the de facto ruler of the Taken after Oryx's death, as well as harnessing a limited ability to take. Since Coria was of course controlled by Savathun, this enabled her to claim the title of Taken Queen. Coria was also integral to another of Savathun's long-standing schemes, trying to control the Vex Collective. We've actually defended the Vex from Savathun several times over the course of Destiny 2. 
the first being on Io during the Red War. As part of an adventure on Io, we discover that something strange is happening to the Vex there. Over the course of the mission, we come across Vex being subdued and taken under the direction of a knight called Ia Arok, Tongue of Coria. We then undergo a series of missions that ends up with Guardians entering the Pyramidian to prevent a full-blown invasion of the Vex network by the Taken. Have a listen to the description of the IO quest, The Long Play. The Taken are assembling a new army to march on the Vex Collective. It is essential to stop them. Savathun's attempts didn't stop there. We returned to Io during Shadowkeep as part of the Festering Core Strike, in which the Taken were once again invading Vex territory on the Jovian Moon. The strike itself is pretty straightforward and ends with us killing a Taken envoy of Savathun, halting another of her attempts to access the Vex network. However, Savathun's plot would eventually see short-lived success during Season of the Splicer, where Coria, under the control of Savathun, not only created the Endless Knight, but also commanded other Vex. Have a listen to Mithrax's words upon uncovering this during the Expunge Activity Labyrinth. I have found the Vex at the source of the Endless Knight. Coria, the Dreaming Mind. Its code has been corrupted by Taken Magic. Sabathun, we've been played. Quiria has been commanding the other Vex, poisoning their minds, directing them at Sabathun's will. The Endless Night is of Sabathun's design. Okay, I'm sure most of you are familiar with what happened next. After Quiria plunged the city into an Endless Night, our Guardian, with the help of Mithrax, entered the Vex network and slayed Coria, breaking Savathun's hold on both the Vex and the Taken. Another major plot of Savathun that I'm sure many of you are familiar with is the curse on the Dreaming City. After the death of Oryx, Savathun quietly made her way into our system and spoke with Riven, the Amkara responsible for the Dreaming City's creation. Riven at this point had been taken by Oryx and offered Savathun the opportunity to pick up her strings. Have a listen to the Lord's tab for the Boots of the Great Hunt. It reads, I am afflicted by tedious repetition, but today I have a visitor. She reminds me of the king, yet subtler. Nothing announces her arrival. Her will does not flow through the system in open challenge against her enemies. Though there are many here she would call enemy, and her will would not flow. It would crash. I did not notice her. That means the light did not notice her. She knows that though I am taken, I am beholden to no one. So I ask her if she wishes to take up those strings. She does, and I take a new shape. My cage loses its purpose. I can tell this is not a part of her grand design. This is an introduction. She's at play. Through our new bond, I glimpse her intention, and I hope she remains at play. Most of those who bargain with me do not win. She releases vibrant, unrestrained bursts of air from her face. I do not. After this, we get the plot for Forsaken. Riven corrupts Aldrin, Aldrin kills Cade 6, and our guardian pursues the Awoken Prince to the Dreaming City, where we slay Riven and unwittingly unleash the curse. It's unclear how much of Forsaken was directly orchestrated by Savathun, as Riven is also a master manipulator. However, the curse loop itself is certainly the Witch Queen's work. The problem with the Dreaming City curse is that even today, we're not certain of its purpose. There are many theories, several of them propagated by Savathun herself, but nothing absolute. Some people think the curse loop is a murder battery, a non-stop cauldron of warfare made to feed Savathun's endless tribute. Another theory, suggested in Truth to Power, is that Savathun is searching for the entrance to the Distributary, a pocket universe that contains the homeworld of the Awoken. A theory you may not have heard of comes from the Hive expert Toland. He suggests that the Dreaming City curse may not have much intent behind it at all, and that is, it is merely a test run for a later scheme. Have a listen to this dialogue when the Guardian meets him in the Ascendant Plane. This curse is a prototype, I'm sure. A step to something far more cunning. What gives this theory more credibility is the appearance of the Endless Knight in Season of the Splicer. 
The Vex simulation has a striking similarity to the Curse loop, especially towards the end of the season when Taken Blights begin appearing in the tower. So perhaps the Curse was indeed a prototype for what would eventually become Samathun's first major offensive against the last city. Moving on from Forsaken, Savathun took a back seat for much of the year. However, one thing we do learn is that she seems to have an interest in the Nine. During Season of the Drifter, we learn the story of Lavinia, a young Cryptarch who discovered the truth about the Nine before immediately being abducted by the Witch Queen. Have a listen to the lore entry, The Witch. It reads, Something dark and hypodermic pierces the void beneath Lavinia and slurps her down, pulls her through a proboscis so tiny that it breaks her apart into a stream of single particles, one after another. She is annihilated and reborn somewhere, somewhen, made of flesh again, shaking and dripping fear, sweat, mewling like a little baby. Her cheek presses against a warm wooden floor. There's a fireplace and a fire in it, and a strong wind outside that sucks at the flames. The clever looking old lady at the desk looks up. Ah, she says, Lavinia, you made it. What? Lavinia gasps. What? She smiles, as if Lavinia's confusion is the sweetest greeting she's ever had. Don't be afraid. You've come to exactly the right place. Where? Some place where you're appreciated. Where we can really use everything you've learned. The old lady pours a thin stream of tea into a cup of bone. Didn't I tell you that you were lucky back when you were born? Savathun's interest in the Nine may stem from their shared desire to harness the light, with the Nine having a lot of information on the subject from studying Guardians. However, so far the Nine remain as ambiguous as ever, and the Witch Queen at least doesn't seem to be in cahoots with them. Savathun emerges again during Season of Opulence, most notably during the Crown of Sorrow raid. During the raid, we board Emperor Kallus' Leviathan to deal with a Cabal gladiator named Galran who was being corrupted by the hive artifact called the Crown of Sorrow. Callus thought the crown would allow Garan to control the hive, but instead it transformed him into a puppet for the Witch Queen. Have a listen to the Lord's tab from the Shadow Greaves boots. It reads, We found the Crown of Sorrow on a stray war moon. The signs guessed that the ritual text surrounding it claimed it was crafted in imitation of the Taken King's power to compel wills. It did the opposite, of course, and consumed my loyalist Galran. That was my first encounter with the witch. She'd been plaguing all my loyalists since then, as sort of a viral language. Perhaps even you. Savathun's presence was felt again during the Shadowkeep expansion. While she has no influence over the Lunar Pyramid and its nightmares, the Witch Queen is responsible for the general aggression of the Hive during this time. It's revealed in the Inquisition of the Damned lore book that Savathun manipulated events to seemingly give the Lunar Hive a chance against Guardians. She then encouraged the Daughters of Crota to build the Scarlet Keep in an open challenge to us. Have a listen to the lore entry Apocrypha. It reads, Somewhere in a Shadow Realm, the Whisper Queen smiles as she ponders death. She has gifted the swarm a weapon of beautiful, perfect destruction and a mighty champion, the means to move beyond their pathetic adherence to a sword logic beyond their grasp. The daughters will see these gifts as a boon, a rising tide to lift the swarm and challenge the light. But a grander design is at play. The bloodline of Oryx has run its course. The luminous conquerors will come once more, they the bringers of death. And the final desperate gasp of a dead king's legacy will serve as an anvil upon which a new sword will be hammered, strengthened, and forged for years yet to come. The purest extension of the logic's intent. While the exact nature of this sword Savathun was forging is unclear, we played right into her hands and exterminated the remnants of Crota's brood. It's possible she's referring to her plan to create Hive Guardians, as that would fit the definition of sword, but it's impossible to know for certain. The Witch Queen remains silent for a little longer before finally stepping out into the spotlight during Season of Arrivals, where she attempts to interfere with our communion with the Pyramid Ship on Io. 
However, even in this open challenge, Savathun still acted through a proxy, Nocris. This wasn't the Witch Queen's first interaction with the estranged son of Oryx, as his brood on Mars attempted to contact her after his defeat during their War Might expansion. Have a listen to this dialogue from the Deathly Tremors adventure on Mars. It's a signal amplifier. They're calling something. I got a fragment of the message. Savathun, emerge from the deep. Take our power. Nocris was of particular interest to Savathun because of his knowledge of the heretical art of necromancy. While she did end up discarding Nocris as a pawn by the end of the season, it wasn't before she had gleaned the secrets of resurrecting the dead from him. Have a listen to Savathun's deal with Nocris in the web lore entry, False Idols. It reads, As a thorn, you have circumvented the deep through forbidden sacrament, and so you shall continue. The deep fears me as we feared you. Ignorance keeps, knowledge usurps. In this, you have found purpose in my court. The high priest's shoulders straightened. You feared me? In a younger time, intents were narrower. I see your value, as we should have then. All who denied you, blinded by the sword, let them fall away as grains from the scythe. I am the implement. You are the mechanism by which we sever their chain. Savathun's voice filled his skull with silken promise. Teach me your necromancy's usurper of the ordered way, so that together we may circumvent the anchored logic that drags us into the depths. Serve as foil to scatter the pieces of their grand game across the cosmos. Naturally, the pyramids weren't too happy at Savathun's interference, and this forced her into hiding during Beyond Light. She wouldn't stay hidden for long, however, as it was shortly after this that Osiris descended into the Hellmouth and lost Sagira. After losing the light, Savathun found Osiris. We don't know the exact version of events, however, following the finale cutscene for Season of the Lost, the real Osiris has been returned to us. Right now, it seems like Osiris is in some sort of coma. According to Petrovenge, Osiris was kept at another location, and Savathun had used a spell to link them together. Essentially, when her crystal was broken and her worm removed, she would trade places with Osiris, allowing her to escape Marisov, St. Fulton, and the Guardian. Have a listen to the radio message from this season, Season of the Lost. What happened? Savathun happened. The Techians believe she enacted a contingency spell the moment the crystal shattered. She transposed herself with another subject marked with a matching hive rune. Osiris. Is he alive? He is. Very weak, but alive. The Techians have confirmed his identity. It's Osiris. No tricks. Do you have any idea where Savathun is now? We... do not. She could be anywhere. If it's any consolation, we do have one thing. What's that? We have Osiris. In a way, Savathun kept her word to the letter. I'll be sure to send her my thanks. I do think there is more to this story. Osiris has not yet recovered at the time of writing this video, and I'm wondering what he will say once he does recover, if he recovers. Regardless, let's talk about Savathun's exploits while disguised as Osiris. She assisted us in defeating Zivirath's High Celebrant in Season of the Hunt, and when we freed the crow from spider's clutches, she also took the new light bearer under her wing. The Witch Queen then advised Zavala during Season of the Chosen in our war against Keitel's champions. Interestingly, it was Savathun that suggested Zavala challenge Keitel to the Rite of Proving, an ancient Cabal custom, ending the conflict over time resulting in a tenuous alliance between the last city and the Cabal Empire. What's troubling is that Savathun is also the one who orchestrated Keitel's invasion of our system to begin with. While it was Zevu Wrath that wiped out Toro Battle and forced the Cabal to flee to Sol, Savathun was the one that manipulated the Cabal general, Uman Arath, into unleashing the Hive God of War. I know. Have a listen to the lore entry, New Gods. It reads, Here comes the Princess Imperial, she said to kneel before our new god. I am Savathun, whispering. Keitel strode forward. Let her go, she told the guards, reluctant. They did as she asked. What god, Uman? What heresies have you invented now? 
Ekman grinned. The God of War, she said, and the earth trembled beneath them. But the God of War has planted her armies elsewhere. It is her sister, smiling, that has taken the ear of the war child Uman Arath. Zivu Arath, hear me. You are war, and I conjure you with war and blood, a gift for my favourite sister. So it would seem that the entirety of Season of Chosen, despite the seasonal focus being the Cabal, was in fact yet another plot by Savathun. It's honestly a bit disturbing when you realise just how many of our recent actions have played right into the Witch Queen's hands. Ikora even comments on this, noting that despite her current circumstances, everything seems to be falling into place for Savathun. Have a listen to this dialogue from the Shattered Realm activity. Zivu Arath's assault on this operation is relentless. While we've been successful, I'm left with a lingering dread. Your guardians have been most tactical, Ikora. I would not fear. We'll succeed. It isn't failure I'm worried about, but success. If Crow and the Guardian hadn't stopped Zivu Arath's high celebrant, we'd be facing an unrelenting army of Wrathborn. Without Savathun's assistance, we may have failed here. She knew. She was ten steps ahead of us the whole time, doing whatever it took to reach this moment. And with that, you're more or less up to speed with the Witch Queen's schemes. I know it's a lot to take in, but there's no real way to sugarcoat it. Savathun really is everywhere. If this past year has told us anything, it's that even when we think we've won, we're still being played by the God of Trickery. And with that, that concludes this latest Destiny 2 lore episode. If you'd like to support the channel and cannot think of a comment, you can leave the word Witch Queen. As usual, it's been a pleasure. This is Marlin Games. Peace.